Next up is uh, Cheryl Deltz, who is uh, one of our local family uh, representatives and a mom and a teacher and um, something of a star in the uh, local educational community, it seems, traveling around everywhere now. And we have one quick announcement. She's going to actually present uh, in the break after uh, this first morning session a very interesting new teaching tool. And her daughter is going to actually show you how she learns math from this tool. So actually there will be an, a, a demonstration outside after this session is over. So I'm going to hand this over to Cheryl. Good morning. My name is Cheryl Dalds and I teach children. I teach third graders at Kingswood Elementary School in Citrus Heights. Citrus Heights is a um, suburb of Sacramento. I've been teaching for 25 years. But the reason I'm really here is my daughter Shana. My daughter Shana was diagnosed with deletion when she was two years old. And this is a picture of her a few weeks ago with her knight in shining armor. Stitch. And a rare photo of Mickey and Minnie together. It's hard to get. So this is Shana. I also want to just brag for a moment. She is the um, student council president at her school. And she's an advanced brown belt in karate, so don't come up behind her too quickly. <laughs> what I'm going to talk to you about today, you know, it's funny. I can, I'm more nervous talking to parents than teachers. I know some of you are teachers, but... Um, this is an important topic. It means a lot to me today. So, what's oh, going on? There we better. Louder. Teacher voice. Got it. Okay. Got it. Okay. Ready? <laughs> All right. What is the research on brain function and the classroom implications? That's the part that's really interesting to me. And then what are some instructional strategies that can help my child succeed? You heard yesterday there are really no silver bullets. But there might be some magic BBs, that's my favorite quote from one of my favorite researchers, um, Bob Marzano. And so what we mean by magic BBs, there might be some instructional strategies that are more likely, what I like to call high probability strategies that can help your child succeed in mathematics. So let's take a look. And I have some real cool transitions. I just went to a workshop on key point. Um, so let's take a look, the review of the terms. So first of all, when we're talking about the parietal lobe, and you started to get into this yesterday, the parietal lobe is a very important part of the brain. And it deals, for a teacher, it deals with, um, it plays a role in reading, writing, language, and calculation. So for, as an educator, when I hear that there might be an issue in that area, it's something by which I take um, careful note. Wendy Cates, My transition, there it is. Has talked about that there, oh, oh dear. There we go. Wendy Cates has talked about that there are great white matter reductions in the parietal lobe that suggest why our kids might have some difficulty in processing and transmitting a mathematical information. But I think the part that really makes more sense to me is this idea about working memory. And working memory is the part that when you can hold some information offline while you process things, if you have trouble doing that, it does lead to issues with comprehension and particularly problem solving. Dr. Simon says that we also want to look at that neurological basis for inattention and spatial issues. And he's beginning to um, work with us and help us understand why our kids have some challenges in this area. The first time I heard him speak on his study, I was relieved because I could never figure out why Shana had so much problems as a young child with dot to dots. Her teacher in kindergarten would send them home. It was such an incredibly difficult thing for her to do. But I think his research has helped us. So when we look at um, instructional strategies that can help your child succeed, Brend is actually, this has the pearl of wisdom that I like to think about. And that if you, what you look for in an educator is someone that has an open mind, a willingness to learn about 22Q, and a creative approach to meeting the child's needs. That's far more important than knowledge of the syndrome initially. What you're looking for is a teacher who's creative and open and differentiates and willing to learn. Um, because our math classrooms, and this is, 
is what's really true. Math is hard because math is hard. <laughs> Deep, isn't it? Math is hard because look at the cognitive load that's required for our kids. In order to do math well, you have a visual component, you have a language component, you have a number component, and all of these require different parts of the brain. And then when you add in the social emotional component, it can be, it can be difficult for children. Another idea that I want to want you to think about more deeply is about the language of mathematics. Because math indeed has its own language. And what we find is that challenges can arrive in math because, there are, because math has symbolic representations, there's syntax, and there's terminology. Let me give you an example that occurs all the time in elementary education. For example, if a, child, if a teacher asked the class to solve the problem 76 take away 8, students could write it mathematically that way. But in a classroom right across the hall, another teacher might say, what's the difference between 76 and 8? Another teacher might say, what's 76 minus 8? And what can happen frequently for our kids is because they are looking at literal representations, a simple change in what terminology your teacher is using could promote some misunderstanding. So one of the things you want to make sure is that you look at that language component and that the same terminology is being used when you look at um, mathematics. When, we look at, when I go into classrooms to look at um, math instruction, here are some things that I look at in terms of s instructional strategies. Shana's getting ready for middle school. It's extensive um, observations in classrooms. And here's what you want to look for. Okay, look at the, the pace of delivery. You're looking for a classroom with a, that the pace is slower, not too slow, but it's a, slower down, a slowed down pace of delivery. You're also looking for information in small chunks. That, what I mean by that is you would see the teacher do some instruction, stop, have discourse with the students, ask questions. They're chunking out the information into small pieces. Another thing you want to look for is that the teacher gives the students opportunities, opportunities to verbalize what they're doing. That's important for our kids particularly because that, when you can have your child verbalize to you what they're doing, that also gives you insight into their thinking. So in a classroom, you might see a teacher say something like, talk with your neighbor. Or when they're working independently, the teacher is going around and asking the students. Those are the kinds of things I look for. And we also want to preview any vocabulary. And but what we want to look for for our kids is that there are pictures and diagrams. So you can have the kids draw pictures and diagrams to make a link to vocabulary. And here's the last part that gets at the part where we were talking about subtraction, minus, looking at key differences. You also want to teach your kids how to look for key words that will point to the appropriate operation. So when they're doing a word problem, if it says how many more, or what's the difference between, help your kids learn those key words. David Sosa, who has a wonderful um, book at the end that's talking about how the special needs brain learns, and it's in, the, um, it's in the handout, which, by the way, I have extra copies in the back. He talks about that we want to, kind of, we want to look at things from a quantitative point of view, meaning that um, we want to help kids look at mathematics from a quantitative sense of that it has definite values. That when you go to teach problem solving, that you do a procedural approach to problem solving and that you approach math as though you're following a recipe. Our kids learn best when math is presented as highly structured with a continual, continual linear, continuous linear focus. And you want to look at hands-on as um, your first step. So what else can we look, like in, look at in a classroom? In my classroom, and, and I'm in a third grade teacher, as I said, um, I have 187 topics in third grade that I'm required to um, teach. I have 185 days of school. And if you take out uh, assemblies or uh, field trips, you can see that the, the structure of classrooms these days is quite rigorous. So sometimes you may be called on, especially when you're planning your child's instructional program, to look at key concepts. And I would like to make that suggestion to you when you're working on with your kids in mathematics in particular, which is an area of struggle for many of our students, that look for key concepts and skills and focus on those areas. In California, we also require that um, we have something called universal access. And what universal access is, is that 
Teachers are supposed to pre-teach any standards that might be difficult for kids, particularly in a special education setting. Pre-teaching means that you've, that you've taught the lesson prior to them getting it in the regular classroom. You as a parent can ask teachers for um, some of those lessons that are the uni universal access lesson and, and they can be done at home. You also might want to consider uh, that students can be given additional time to complete assignments and tests. And think about alter alternative assessments, meaning like for Shana, the ability to show what she knows using manipulatives versus just paper pencil is really important. So I have that written into her IEP, that she has an op many opportunities to show what she knows, not just paper pencil. And the pre-teaching piece, I can't stretch, stress that enough. Shana's special ed teacher actually when she works with Shana Pryor on the key concepts that we've identified, when Shana gets instruction in her classroom, it's not the first time she's heard it. It's maybe the third or the fourth time. That increases her confidence, it makes her feel successful, and that's really a nice technique. So one of the first things you want to talk about when, when teachers say manipulatives, what they mean, it's a fancy teacher term, but it means things that kids can manipulate or move or, or use. You want to start with manipulatives when you're talking about mathematics, and then move quickly to pictorial representations. Also want to think about boxing computation items for students, meaning if you have a page that has a lot of computation on it, put them into boxes or have them done on graph papers so that students aren't overwhelmed by the um, problems on the page. Another thing that works well is folding a worksheet. So if your child comes home with a, a worksheet for homework that's got so much on it, fold it for them so that they're not overwhelmed by the paper. It'll go back to school all folded. Shana's work goes back folded a lot of different ways, but that's okay. Highlight the directions for them and the cues. If there are large print materials available, look at large print materials. Ask if you can consider that. This is another thing that's worked really well. Um, it might be one of those um, high impact strategies. Ask that if they have a test, let's say there's 10 problems on a test, ask if your student can have one example written on the test. So maybe the first problem is an example. And on Shana's homework, she always has one example done so that it's not, she has something to look at. And most of your publishers these days on the um, materials that they send home, you, they do have examples on the reteach uh, version. And another thing you can do is have, um, ask for answer boxes on a math site, a math page. Here's the sequence that you want to look at. When you're looking at mathematics, we tend to go from concrete, that's the, the technical term again for something they can physically feel, to pictorial or graphic, and then to abstract. The second stage, pictorial or graphic, is the most difficult, I think, for teachers to get in. You'll frequently see teachers using um, manipulatives. That's a common strategy. But usually we tend to go right from um, concrete to abstract. So let's say an example might be if you had the number five, if a student had five counters, the, the abstract version of that would be the numeral five written down. And so what, what research tells us many times is kids need to have that sequence going to the pictorial or graphic stage. What Shane is going to actually show for you on the break is an example of using interactive boards or technology. Technology can frequently get in that second step for us, friends, that pictorial or graphic step that's very difficult to get in. The instructional sequence that seems to work best is a demonstration or modeling Meaning you would have kind of, I tell my um, student teachers, it's the I do it, the second step, the guided practice is we do it, and then the independent practices, they do it. So that's a, a step that's very successful with our kids. So you show them, you do it with them, and then they work independently. One of the things I like to do too with kids is um, help them learn to be self-directed, meaning if you can, teach kids to say steps out loud to themselves as they work a problem or a process that they can learn to say that to themselves independently. It's kind of that metacognition, helping our kids to verbalize more. Now, I wish, I wish Donna, is Donna here? There she is. Donna, watch this transition. Yes, because Donna is on fire. Donna is my teaching hero. I've, Donna Landsman is an incredible educator who is, has done so much work for us, and I'm so excited to even be in the same room with her. Um, 
these are the big four from Donna in terms of what you can do in a classroom, and she'll bring that up again when she speaks. Preferential seating. Really important that your kids have preferential seating. Um, and that you're looking for teachers that they model rather than just explain. Okay, so you're looking for teachers that model what, what we mean by that is they're showing how they do it. It's not just the talking. Teachers tend to be pretty auditory. Our kids need visual and kinesthetic. And then the other thing that I ask my, my child's teachers to do, and they, they do, is um, this term is called check for understanding. That's teacher jargon, but basically it means that you're, after you've taught a lesson, you're going to check in with kids and make sure that they understand. Some teachers are very elaborate. They have signals. They do other things. But what I ask is that when the kids are, are at independent practice, so remember that sequence, the I do it, we do it, they do it, We're on the, when they're on the they do it, portion that you have the teachers ask that they can just check in with your child and make sure that when they're working independently, say, can you just check in with Shana when you get to independent practice? Easy for a teacher to do. And then very important is that you have a homeschool communication program in place so that you can um, get quick news from a teacher if there's an issue so you can work with them at home. Just some more ideas. Um, Highlighting the operation sign. If your child comes home with a, a computation that has lots of different operations, it's really hard for our kids to switch gears. You'll see um, if you haven't gotten to long division, ah, long division, um, that was really a challenge. Shana had done pretty well with um, multiplication, um, adding and subtracting, but when you put all of them together in one operation, it became a challenge. So looking, highlighting the operation sign, using color coding, um, um, mnemonics. And what I mean by that is, um, what we when I said with Shana when she was trying to learn rounding, we had a little chant, and I would say four or less, just ignore, five or more, add one more. So creating like little chants or sayings or things to help your kids. Another one, the, the, the tried and true about um, my very excellent mother just served us noodles. You know, used to be served us nine pizzas when we still had Pluto. And, and I think there will be... Um, a day when we'll say, when I was your age, Pluto was still a planet. That's always my, poor Pluto. But um, so there you have it. I feel bad. Um, peer teaching. Look for a classroom. Think about peer teaching. And actually think about your student doing the peer teaching. Think about Shana works with um, kindergartners and first graders on assignments. It's, and so I want you to think about having your child be the peer tutor instead of the, the one that gets tutored. Look at, the, look at color. Color can help us a lot. And then the other thing that Shana and I do is we take familiar tunes and change the lyrics to help us memorize stuff. So think about using that. She loves to sing. And I want you to understand this part. It's really important when we're working with our kids and um, the social and emotional um, component of this. Our kids sometimes get frustrated with their problems with memory because they don't know quite know how to correct it. So be very aware, especially when it comes to mathematics, um, it can provide some anxiety level. So that pre-teaching of lessons can be very helpful. And um, also recognize that there, there are multiple ways to uh, go after instruction. Now we're going to go to um, a kind of a new horizon. This is technology, ah, technology supported math instruction. That's my classroom. Those are, those are my kids. And um, in the back, you see an interactive whiteboard. You see computers. You see paper, pencil. You see, I go after anything I can. I try and work. I've written a lot of grants um, to get technology. But um, I'd like to suggest today that that's a, a purpose for technology that can be really supported and that we can think about. So how does it help us? Well, what it can do for us is it can build you know, computational fluency. Like accelerated math was helpful for Shana, but I did have to tell the teacher to extend her time. Accelerated math is a program where the kids would work on their math facts. Um, there is some conversion software that's some starting to come out that can help our kids with text and notations. There's a lot of nice stuff on building conceptual understanding. There's some nice organizing, so organizing software for our kids. Inspirations works well. 
This next um, piece, student learner response systems to give instant feedback. In Shana's classroom, she has a student learner response system. So while her teacher is teaching, the students input answers to questions, and student, Shana gets instant feedback about, it doesn't identify who got it right and who got it wrong. The teacher can get that information, but it says what the right answer is so students know exactly how they are doing. And another thing I'd like to think about is about this idea of multiple repetitions in a way that's, that is motivating for children. Technology can do that for us. And if you think about Dr. Simon's um, work and looking at video games, it does provide um, multiple repeti um, repetitions in a fun way. And think about if you've ever played the games, how exactly how you, every, when you go through the game and then you're little, you lose your little person, um, you've learned that you're not going to do that step again. So I think it can provide some insight for us. Now, interactive whiteboards. The one in the handout, the one that where it says prometheumplanet.com. I think I know I make Dr. Simon crazy because I'm always asking, adding things onto my my presentation. This didn't make it onto your handout. So that prometheumplanet.com is a website that um, has some nice resources for special education. It has some videos and some things that you can look at so you can get a sense of what interactive whiteboard technology can provide for our kids. Um, the, the picture in the left-hand corner is a student learner response system. It's a little, little pod thing so that you can um, check in your answers. Shane is actually has text in their answers. And certain words are not allowed to be texted, but um, they text in their answers. So here's what, it, here's what I like about interactive whiteboards. It allows students to process information using all modalities. It gets to that pictorial representation, and Shana is going to show you on the break. I hope you'll go out. She's going to do a little demo for you. Um, student learner response systems for feedback. And if, if you've ever heard my presentation before, I always have a Shana tip, because she's really the expert about how she learns. And so this is why, here's what she said. About my classroom gives me instant feedback. The board makes kids want to participate more, and it helps kids who do not know English because of the pictures and videos. Shana actually goes to a school where half the children in her school, English is not their first language. That was a choice for me, a conscious choice for me for Shana, because all of the teachers, it happens to be the school where I teach, but um, we have to rely on picture cues and visual cues and concrete manipulatives because a lot of our kids don't speak English. It happened to work, it happens to work very well for um, her learning style. Here's another idea I'd like to share with you. Um, this is a great website called mathtrain.tv. There are lots of websites like this. Um, Mr. Um, Marcos, who's like Don Landsman, one of my another teaching hero. He and his students have developed videos to teach other kids about things. So for here, you can see quick look at dividing fractions with Philip, finding percents and, and using proportions with Jerry. So there's all these videos that he's done with his students to help kids. It's motivating and um, informational. And what I like about it also is the repetition. Here's another idea: iPods. This, is, this kind of blew me out of the water. Shana and I, when we were looking at um, middle schools, the middle school that she's going to go to next year, I hope, we're trying to open enroll her in, um, the math teachers have um, wrote a grant and got the, the touch iPods. And when the teacher does their lesson, he's downloaded all his lessons onto these iPods with a podcast. He does the lesson. And then while the kids are working, he can walk around and say, OK, you need to go back to slide number four or you need to go back and replay the, the lesson. Now, my suggestion to you might be is that if you have a teacher that uses um, PowerPoints, which a lot of the publishers are providing, you could ask for the PowerPoints and put them on um, a video so that you can go back and replay the lessons. Okay? So, um, and if you want, the podcast piece is easy to add. You can just, you can add that as a track over. But it was really effective. And his math scores have just rocketed through the roof, as you can well imagine. Because when the kids need repetition, gives them iPod, they put it on, um, practice it. So we'll start thinking about technology in terms of how it can provide opportunities for repetition, visual, and visual input for our kids. Five minutes. Oh, I'm almost done. I'll go fast. Okay. Um, this is an example of um, just that a lot of textbooks are going electronic, so ask, you can ask for that. On these, on these websites, the top one where it says uh, sanjuan.edu select math, 
that's my district website. And if you go to that, we're constantly updating it. And these are websites that are particularly helpful, that we find that are helpful for kids. And this is all in your handout. You can't read it? Oh, dear. OK, I will. Um, We'll be on the website later. Right? Oh, oh dear, I'm very sorry. Now, Donna's book and Donna's up next. Um, I have multiple copies, and as I, when I first meet my child's teacher, I don't, I don't, I don't come in and say, "Hi, I'm Cheryl. Here's a book that will help you teach my child better." That's not the way to approach it. So I start by building a relationship. And as the questions start to come, which will come from that teacher that, you've, that you're looking at, when they say, well, I'd like a little more information, then that's the time to say, here, I've got a resource for you that might be helpful. So Donna's book, you want multiple copies. Um, excellent, excellent resource. And I'll just end with this. Um, the Velocardiofacial Syn Syndrome Foundation, there are, their catchphrase that for their organization is knowledge and ho is hope. And I believe that to be the case. What I want to hang my hat on is that idea of neuroplasticity and that our brains have a lifelong ability to change as a result of new experiences and um, new learning. We all know this to be true. So I believe at the bottom of my heart that when we collaborate as parents with researchers such as Dr. Simon to increase the base knowledge for our kids, we're going to get interventions to help our students reach their potential. And that's what we want for our kids is to reach their potential. It's the best that we can hope for. So um, there's the uh, light of my life, Ms. Shana. And she's going to be the references here. And she'll be out on the break to, she's in the back waving at you. And her bright orange shirt, you can't miss it. Um, so she'll be on the break. I hope you'll come out. And she wants to show you how, um, she, how we use interactive whiteboards. So thank you so much for your kind attention. <laughs>